Let's just take a text of scripture to start. The book of Genesis chapter 1. The Bible says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. The Bible says, Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Verse 4, God saw that the light was good. And then what he did, that's why we are referring to this portion. The Bible says, God separated the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the Bible says, and there was, one, there was evening, and there was morning, and then one day. That is, the day starts in the evening. Now, just to get um, our things clear, we can go down a few verses to verse 14. The Bible says, Then God said, in verse 14, Let there be light in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for light in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. He said, So God made, verse 16, God made two great lights. The greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. And he made the stars also. I just want to use this to remind why I read this later portion. It just to point out the fact that God made the sun, all right, and the moon and the stars later in the days of creation. This was the first day, right? But before that time, he had made light in the beginning. He said, let there be light, and there was light. That tells you that light existed before the sun existed. It's just a, I mean, it's really clear like that in the scriptures. There was light before there was sun. The sun, this is my own interpretation of it, the sun is a storage medium from which God releases light in a controlled fashion to the environment, which is what we take part in on the earth. Now, why am I reading this? Just to remind us that we said it last time, that God, when light was made, light still, darkness still existed. And there was a mixture of light and darkness. When light comes, light can be there while darkness is still there. And that was why God, the Bible says, now separated the light from the darkness. I just read out that second portion just to show that this was not the sun. It was not talking about the day and the night. There was a physical quantity called light. There was a physical quantity called darkness. These things were present. And when God introduced light into the place, darkness was still there. He now came down and said, okay, darkness moved to this side, light moved to the other side. And that was so that he can progress with the course of creation. He needed to do that separation. We're talking about going in and possessing the land. And what I'm going to bring out here is this. God says, before you can go in and possess your land, you must do the work of separating light from darkness in your life. Because if you don't, the next day of creation cannot happen. If you don't purify your light... All right? The progress of creation that God wants to happen in your life will not happen. Quickly, let's open to the book of 2 Corinthians and see something there. That's chapter 6. He said in verse 14, Do not be bound together with unbelievers, for what partnership has righteousness and lawlessness? And what fellowship has light with darkness? Now note that. What fellowship has light with darkness? That is, you see here, Paul was explaining that sometimes you find light fellowshipping with darkness and that it is not appropriate. It is not as if once there's light, darkness goes away. Sometimes darkness stays and it is the duty of believers to separate light from darkness. He said in verse 15, light with darkness is like Christ with Belial. And he also said, what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? That is, the believer is, represents light in this context, and the unbeliever represents darkness. He said, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? And I said, we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will walk in them. He said, I, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, he said, separate your light from, your, from the darkness. Now, I'm adapting the next line. Can you see the way I twisted it there? What he said literally is this. Therefore, come out from their midst 
and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean. And I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. He said, therefore, now Paul did not break this, okay, so the next verse is part of what we are reading here. He said, therefore, having these promises, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now, please, I'm going to emphasize this issue of light here. You see what was Paul explaining? If you are going to experience the manifestation of, of God as your father, and you must understand what it, what it means to have God as a, as a father. He said, when the Lord Jesus was speaking later in Matthew chapter 6, all right, as earlier, in Matthew chapter 6, he said, your heavenly father knows that you need, have need of these things. He said, your heavenly father, listen, takes care of the birds of the air, takes care of the flowers of the field. He said, he will much more take care of you. He said, do not have any anxiety. He was telling them, don't worry about tomorrow. This is the job of your heavenly father. He knows what you need before you even ask him. Now, I'm going to explain something here. These are the manifestations of God as father. I hope, are you getting my point? Are you following me? Am I alone here? If you are here, say amen. amen. Thank you. Now, let me emphasize what the Bible says when it talks about being a father. All right? What it was saying, therefore, that when you're talking about provision, God opening doors, God doing great things for you, that is a manifestation of the fatherhood of God. And Paul was telling us here, he, he said, and I will be a father to you. That is, if you are going to experience my fatherhood, what you will do is to separate light from darkness in your life. Don't allow the two to mix. You know, we may explain something, you know, in this our series, Going and Possess the Land, like I've been emphasizing, you will notice that we are not teaching principles, steps, how to save your money, how to invest your money. Now, let me say, explain something. God has those principles. There are divine precepts that also manifest like that. But there is something deeper than that. When I taught the series, Foundations and Pillars of Financial Prosperity, I explained that pillars are the things that people can easily see. You see somebody, he tells you that a man wakes up at a particular time, he's disciplined, he has a good account. And I teach that also, okay? He said, know the condition of your flock. That's the foundation, that's the principle for accounting. So we must know accounting. We must know how to handle our money. You must know whether you're making money or losing money. So those things are real. But all of those things are pillars. Foundations are invisible. I've been emphasizing. Foundation is something that you can't see looking from outside. The only way you know, in fact, even the man who did what was foundational, sometimes he doesn't know. Spiritual things, sometimes people practice them, and they are not aware that was exactly what I did. You understand? And the Bible says that he himself does not know how. So foundations are difficult to discern, except you look into the word of God. The word of God actually is the foundation. And that's what we are dealing with here. That is, we are emphasizing more on what is foundational when it comes to outward success in life. Do you get the point I'm making here? So all those pillars, things that are the pillars, things like uh, do this on time, talk to your customers well, make sure you are very neat, dress properly, you know, brush your teeth properly before you talk to your clients, you know, all those kind of things. <laughs> all right, the Lord is good. Those things are things that will manifest naturally if the foundation is right. What will happen is that we know we'll talk about the word works. The word will bring forth wisdom for you when you get to difficult situations. He will tell you how to live, how to do, so that he will bring forth the results that's planted inside your heart. However, what is deeper than those things is that foundation. And we're explaining here that for you to understand the, uh, to enjoy the fatherhood of God, you must have a separation of light from darkness. This is how we labor, we believers. Our labor is, first of all, in the things that are not seen by every other person. Our labor is, first of all, in spiritual matters. Let me give you an example. You want to start a business, you want to start an endeavor, a career, and then you take time out for weeks and months and maybe years. You are trying to separate light from darkness in the way people do things. You know, if you've just been around for some time, you see that most human beings, they are, their operations are filled with darkness. They are, when I say, what, do I, what do I mean by darkness? Darkness does not mean that, you see, everybody is, uh, is telling lies to get by. They are stealing. They are cheating. Sometimes, all we are talking about there concerning darkness is the motive. I was telling my wife the other day, we are talking about people's motivation for what they want to do in life. For example, let's separate light from darkness, as an example, in the life of the apostles. 
They came to Jesus Christ, James and John, and said, let us sit on your left and on your right in your kingdom. And then Jesus now said something to them. Let us separate light from darkness. The princes of this world, what do they do? They lord it over their people. If you say a man is a minister, you find that people are always doing something to be the lord. Now, one of our brothers said the other day, he said in their church, he was so angry because the pastor stopped praise and worship that he should go out to the road to go and welcome their pastor, their senior pastor that went abroad. He was coming back. The church members <laughs> to go to the road. <laughs> now, I'm bringing something here. Sometimes as Christians, we don't realize this thing slips in, you know, they slip into our practice. We start behaving like the world. So Jesus said to them, this is not right. Amongst you, the greatest amongst you must be the servant of all. So at the point in time, he came down and washed their feet. That here, greatness is not determined by how much you are served. It is determined by how much you can serve. Separating light from what? Darkness. Can you see that? That's what I was trying to explain. When you, if you see Paul said there, what has light? What has a believer got, do, got to do with an unbeliever? What was he talking about? There are principles by which believers are supposed to live. That don't mix it with principles by which unbelievers are living. That day, my wife and I were discussing. I said, one of the things I've noticed that kills, you know, Christians, all right, that is their spiritual work, is this desire to be preeminent, desire to be first. And I read from the scriptures, I found out that God said, never desire it. Don't want to be in front. Don't want to be the first. Don't want to be the one in front. If you really want to go far, he said, choose to be the one at the back. If you can serve without being noticed, better for you. That is light. But oftentimes, what do we do? We mix it with what? Darkness. So we establish church ministry on the same principles. And then you bring in a business book (laughs) to teach you how to do leadership in church. That is called mixing light with darkness. And you know what happens? That's why we don't experience the fatherhood of God. I hope hope, hope I follow my, my point here. That is why he said, that's why we don't experience, because Paul was saying to us there, if we want to experience the fatherhood of God, we are careful to separate light from darkness. We come out from amongst them and we are separate. If you see, Paul said something, he wasn't talking about physical separation, because he said, when I said that you shouldn't relate with people who are sinners, I wasn't talking about unbelievers. He was saying that I I expected you to use that to discipline people who are believers. He said, because in this world, you must interact with unbelievers. So when he says be separate, what was he talking about? How do you live? What are the foundations for what you do? I said something earlier. We're talking about, you know, um, um, outward success, b- breakthrough, victory in life. The problem, let me say it again, why, God, why we have not seen what God actually wants to do is because we have not done enough separation of life from darkness. We still compete. For example, let me just quickly drop this. You must never desire to be on the list of richest men in the world. God can make you richer, make you so rich that Ngote will look like a pauper. It's possible. But God says, I don't want that desire in your heart. Just get up and go and serve. If in the process of serving, one day you discover the net value of the material resources I have put under your control. Again, that's under light and darkness. We believers don't ever think we have. Did you hear what I said? Did you get that? We never have this, I have mentality. You have this, I have been put in charge mentality. There is a difference between I have or have been put in charge. Listen, if we will properly, in our reasoning pattern, okay, separate light from darkness, making us anything in life is the easiest issue with God. This is how, in quotes, let me, pardon me to use the word bad. This is how bad God is. If he has to kill everybody, physically slaughter them so they can walk through, he'll do it. It's not, it's not the first time. When they wanted to remove from Egypt, they say they can't go. It's all right, kill everybody. That's it. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a new thing. They say, all right, they're attacking us. Okay, we just call one angel. Only you. I don't want to. One person, kill all the soldiers. 125,000 people dead overnight. It's, it's a usual thing. It's not, it's not a big deal with him. It's not a big deal. He wants Samaria to have food. He said, okay, he brought some angels. 
cause commotion there, make sure everybody's dead. If that is what it needs to get things done, I'll do it. He said, kiss his son, lest he be angry. That scripture is very powerful. That is, you don't want him to get angry. And it's Jesus is talking about here. He said, when he's angry, you perish out of the way. So I'm not emphasizing, God doesn't have any problem. But what he has a problem with is that if I put you there, what are you going to become? Another packaging of darkness. Are you still behaving the dark way? That what I am doing in your life is to separate light from darkness. That is when you will discover my fatherhood. We, this is why we succeed. We labor in things like this. Let me review what we said last time quickly so that I can get into the main thing I want to say today. In fact, this one, some of the things we said, I'm just amplifying it. I've been emphasizing the fact that we don't succeed by strength, human strength. We do it by grace. And I said, I'm going to develop that further. That believers have two powers. That is two things that they can do. Things that are under their power when it comes to grace. We can activate grace or we can inhibit grace. Talking about this light and darkness thing. That is one way by which grace is inhibited. When light is mixed with darkness. Let's bear that in mind. Let me remind us of what we said also. That Peter sank even though he was obeying the call of God for his life. Why did he sink? Because he was not persistent in focusing on the grace that was keeping him afloat. I said believers don't sink because of difficulty. They sink because their eyes are removed. For example, if you maybe you're a businessman, you have to do dealing in today, you know, abroad and locally. When they tell you the price of the dollar, you know, you suddenly start to wonder. They start calling people, how can we bring it down? You have removed your eyes from what? From Jesus Christ. That's what happens. That's it. It's that telling that it's likely to tumble further. And this may, you know, you start thinking, now, what happens to us as believers? When we start operating like that, we start going down. And somebody will say that it's the economy, it's not the economy. Jesus said, the day you heard that news, you should have brought out your Bible and read what the Word of God said first about the change in the value of your currency. If you did that, you will have remained afloat. I don't have time to explain it now, okay? But please just bear it in mind. Somebody will, that will help somebody. Now, we explained it. Now, I said something. Let me just explain that because one of the things I'm going to say today. That anytime we have challenges in life, let's remember, God is saying it is a call to a higher level of grace work. You're doing business. You're, you're married. You're enjoying your marriage. Your life is going on smoothly. Then suddenly trouble comes. All right? Between you and your husband, between you and your wife, you and your children, or you lose your job. Money is not flowing as it used to flow. There's no time to start calling everybody and start whining and wondering what happened. He said it's a time to go for a higher level of grace. And this is how grace comes. It comes by the release of the word of God. We've looked at that again and again. That Zerubbabel was going to succeed by the prophesying of the prophets. As Zechariah and Haggai will fill him with the oil of God that has come because they are standing, because the prophet is somebody who is hearing the word of God and delivering to you. As the, the oil of God is flowing into the life of Zerubbabel. Then he shines brighter. That's how it is. And we read from that Ezra chapter 6 that those elders of Israel, they succeeded through the prophesying of Haggai and Zechariah, which means if there is trouble, what I do is to go and hear a new word. Let me quickly explain something to you. Once I remember this happened to me while I was a, in fact, I wrote an article on it. I think it's just somewhere inside my house. I was doing my NYC at that time, and then I saw a case of um, Adieba Lokun. Now, you wonder what that is? It's a principle. It's an African principle. Let me say it again, in case you want to write it down. It's called the principle of Adieba Lokun. <laughs> All right, anyway, it's a Yoruba proverb. <laughs> That's the. That's the first part. Now, I only say so that in case somebody listening to this understands you, but you know what I'm talking about. But actually, what it means, let me give you the full thing, which means is that when the cock or the hen lands on a line, you know, a closed line. Have you ever seen it before? Many of you have not seen it. You only see chicken when they are dead. I mean, you should try and see one that's alive in the village running around, all right? I don't mean all this one that's inside a cage. The ones that roam around, you know, foul, okay? Sometimes they get a, find a, an idea into their heads. They decide to go and land on the clothesline, you know, on the rope. And it's always an interesting sight. Because the animal will refuse to go away. And the rope, the line will refuse to stay in one place. So it starts going like this. 
starts to I see the thing flapping, flapping. I'm making a lot of noise. This is the interesting part. And it will refuse to go away. Normally, it will stay there for a long time. Maybe after like a minute or two, it will finally give up and fly and land somewhere else. So they have a saying like that in Western Nigeria. They say the cock has landed on the line. Neither the line nor the cock is at rest. <laughs> That's what I mean by it. the cock is not at rest. The line is not at rest. Now, the day I was watching this when I was doing my youth service, and because I was cooking up spiritual things, I used to get inspiration from everything. I went back home that day and wrote a seven. And I titled it, On What Do You Rest? Because sometimes we rest on things that can't carry our weight. That's what I'm going to explain. The word of God is real, okay? Sometimes you get to a particular point, God says, this is the milk you are dealing with. You have not gotten to a point where you need the meat of the world to go further. That's what I'm saying. So if you have challenges, God is saying, you need a new revelation to move from this point to the next. It doesn't mean that what you knew before was wrong. It's no longer applicable at this particular point in time. You need something else. That's why, as you know, I was telling my wife the other day, we're talking about, I'm really saying I'm talking to my wife. I talk to her all the time. That's the reason. You know, you know why? We live in the same room. <laughs> oh, is that a revelation? <laughs> well, I don't know, but yesterday night something happened. I woke up at 1 a.m. Kept her awake till like 2 a.m. because I was on the phone discussing some issues. When I finished, I said, wake up. You need to hear this. So that, that's why you keep on hearing me say, I was talking with my wife. It's just what happens, okay? So if you don't hear it one day, wonder what happened to your wife travel. <laughs> I was discussing with my wife the principle of Sabbath, okay? Let me just please say this. Believers, we don't have a law that says don't work on Saturdays. But the principle of Sabbath, it remains eternally. What we're discussing, my wife and I were analyzing with the issue of holidays. People take holidays. I told her, I said, do you know very few people actually take a real Sabbath rest? When God gave children, the, the, the people of Israel, the Sabbath laws, you couldn't go for a distant wedding. Because there was a limit to which you could travel on a Sabbath day. So, if your relatives decide to wed, and you couldn't travel before that Friday evening, that's it. You decide to wed on Saturday, that's the end, you can't go. Because they had the exact distance you could travel on a Sabbath day. You couldn't even go to church, in quotes, in Chukot now, if the church was far away from your home, if it's beyond what they call a Sabbath day's journey. The reason is that he expected them to rest. Nobody could walk. God commanded that your animals too must rest. And if you read what Paul was saying later, right into the Corinthians, he said, anytime God gave commandments about animals, he was not primarily concerned about the animals. He was concerned about something superior to them. I'm bringing out an issue here. So when God said, even your animals couldn't work, you know what he was saying? I need your animals to be at rest so as to help you remain totally at rest. <laughs> That's my own application of it. You couldn't do anything on the Sabbath day. He said, you don't kindle a fire. So your wife couldn't cook, your maid couldn't cook, you couldn't cook. Any food you haven't made before Sabbath rest commences, you don't eat it. Why was that? I'll tell you. The reason is because we need a time in which we get new revelation for a new season. And it doesn't come in the midst of too much activity. I don't know whether I'm getting my point. Now, I was listening to Ken Higgins as I was driving down and it, well, earlier in the day. And he said something. He was just analyzing his life. He said he likes to listen to other preachers. Well, he liked, then he was still alive then. But he found out that he hardly had the time. That he used to preach 11 times a week. Because in the Bible school, he gives two lessons every day. And then he still preaches Sunday evenings. Now, I'm bringing an issue. And he said that to preach that number of times, you also need a lot of preparation. He said, for that reason, I find it hard. He wasn't saying it's a good thing. He was trying to say it was he's not saying it's a good thing. To listen to other people because of time. So that when he has an opportunity, he tries to take advantage of it. Now, that is why, as a person, I say, which was our announced that this Saturday will be our last meeting here for the year. We do our seminar and I close. A time will come, if this ministry continues to run like this, the ministry may not shut down. But I will go away. Some people will go away. But I want to, everybody who want to be coming, be coming, be praying, be playing. But you won't see me for one full month. Why? And listen, it's not just for preachers, it's for everybody. 
Most of the time, what we do, which is what my wife and I were discussing, people, when they are on holiday, that is when they are busiest. They are flying all over the place. They are looking at rhinos and hippopotamuses. And they, they, God, it may look like you are relaxing. God say, fine, but I actually don't want you to look at rhinos and hippopotamuses. I actually want you to lie down on the bed. You just reach for a Bible and start reading. I want you to kneel down somewhere and start praying. I want you to sit down and have fellowship with people of like mind in your home and just discuss. Because in the midst of that, that I release a word to take it to the next level. If you are too busy all the time, you will never... Because we are, we are preaching by grace. So. That's why, listen, we don't get the kind of revelations that we've been discussing, all right, that can help a believer get off from one level of doing, as an example, business, and move to another level tomorrow. Because we are too busy. Every challenge in life is a call, I've been saying it, to walk in a new level of grace. New levels of grace only come when the new level of oil flows into your life. That's the way it is. So when I say a challenge to walk in a new level of grace, it's not by kneeling down and praying alone. When you finish praying, there's a word you must get. It might lift up from the pages of the book, the Bible to you. Or you bought a book, somebody was teaching deep, deep inside there, and you heard a new word. That something new must be kindled in your life to take it to the next level. Each person's word is unique. Somebody is preaching. There will be hundreds of people listening. They all hear different things. Some people will say, the day you said this, the day I heard this, my life took a new turn. In fact, the example I gave, I've given a number of times, was a young man who was hearing me preach on radio. And they just heard that I said, blessings are spiritual. How he interpreted what I said, I don't know. All I know is that the guy said, blessings are spiritual. That he's blessed in the realm of the spirit. He said after that, he entered into his room and went into the realm of the spirit to collect the blessing. This was a young boy. A, a, a day or two later, his uncle called him and said, how are you doing? Fine. You finished your secondary school or something? He said, yes. Yeah. So what do you want to do next? He's not sure yet. He said, would you like to be a pilot? Ah, the boy said, why not? It's all right. What you will do, you will come over to North America. I'll, I'll, I'll collect the funds for you. I will pay for you to go to, to a piloting school. What they call school of aviation, whatever. So the boy ran down to Enugu to come and tell me thank you. Why? Because he was listening to a message on radio. And I said, blessings are spiritual. Now, it may look like common knowledge to all of us. But to him, it gave him something that he had never realized before. What the boy actually heard was that it is not, blessings don't come from people. It's not your own labor. It's not your energy. It's a spiritual substance. So he said, fine, let me get my spiritual substance. And he went into the realm of prayer. That was what he did, though. And a few days later, a new door opened for him in life. And he ran down to come and say, I'll soon be traveling. I just said, let me come and tell, thank you. Let me tell you, thank you for that thing that I heard you say on air. You need a word to launch you to a new realm. For us, the word of God is not information. It's not just principles. Put your foot here. Don't put it here. No. It's life. If things are not working properly for you, what God is saying is that, take it, come aside. Rest for a while. Get a bread for a new season. Eat for the journey is long. Are you getting my point? Weariness of the spirit is why things stop going well properly. And what the Lord says is that, come and eat. Take a spiritual substance. Eat for the journey is long. The way spiritual food is, if you see, when, when God said, when the angel said that to Elijah, the Bible said he went in the strength of just a single meal, yeah, twice. For, uh, for 40 days, the man was walking. And my, my, my understanding from there is this. For every season of life, there is a bread you must eat. For every season of life, there is a bread you must eat. And that bread we're talking about, what we call bread, is a revelation of God's word. Very personal to you. Listen, we can't solve problems the way human beings solve problems. It's one of the things I was trying to get to. How do, hum- do human beings solve problems? Let's talk about that. Remember, Israel, when they had the problem, what did they do? They went to Samuel, in first Samuel, and said, give us a king. Why do you need a king? Because our enemies are always attacking us. How are we going to solve our problems? We get a king, he will organize a proper army. Let me say something to you quickly. Be very careful 
<laughs> when common knowledge is being used to plan your life. Your children will go to school tomorrow, invest in stocks. Be careful. <laughs> Are you getting my point? They say for the future of your children, start investing in stocks. Start building houses so that they will collect rent. If you do that, your children will be rent collectors. I'm telling you, I know what, listen. They won't build new houses. All they will be doing is collecting rent. You know, <laughs> I'm about to say it again. My wife and I were talking. <laughs> I said, I told her, I said, you know what? People actually don't, people love the kingdom, but they don't want to enter. Yes. You describe to them what life is in the kingdom. God will be a father to you. You will have no problem. In his kingdom, the sun shines around the clock. And, well, the light is there around the clock because the sun does not need to shine because the glory of God is the light of that place. Oh, we say that is beautiful. After all, human beings try to achieve that. You know that? Human beings don't like darkness, physical darkness. That was what made John D. Rockefeller the richest man in the world in his time. Because he was trading in kerosene. He was the one that wiped out. He lengthened the number of hours they had during the day. And then the people with electric bulb, Edison, came along and gave us you know, filament bulb and all of that. Men love light. People will become more productive. I do a lot of my work at night. And that's actually what heaven is like. It's a place where there's no darkness. We like the description of the kingdom. Where food grows by itself, you don't struggle where you are always very happy and joyful, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, that's the kingdom. But then, everything has a door. The door to the kingdom, Jesus said that door is what? It's narrow. It's narrow. When you use the word straight, straight doesn't mean it's a straight line. Straight means it's you squeeze through. You know, you have to be an arm member to pass through. Put one leg, turn, twist, put one hand, push, push, push. In the process, you are getting scratched. Your money suit is going to get torn. That, that, that dress you made with Italian silk, you know? It's going to get a tear. Oh, I forgot your skin. It's going to be bruised because you want to enter into the kingdom. And <laughs> another thing, they say, enter. I say, ah, move in now. They say, wait, wait, wait. Your ring is causing problem. You remove it. It's your shoe. You remove it. You come in sometimes naked. Can't carry any load through the eye of a needle. Guess what? That is where most people turn around and go back. <coughs> Just like Israel. They wanted to enter into the promised land. They had the stories, the promises. They had legends about it. Let's go there where we'll be free. We'll not be slaves. Where rain falls. It didn't used to fall in Egypt. In Egypt, you used to irrigate from the waters of the Nile. But this one, you go to the promised land where rain falls. You don't need connection. Connections will come to you. As a businessman, are you getting my point? When you go and pray, when maybe local authorities are making trouble, you go and pray and they remove the local government chairman because he's disobeying the word of God. That's kingdom life. Are you getting my point? Israel too liked it. But going to the, to the promised land now, you have to pass the wilderness. Ah, what is it? There's no food here. The water is difficult. No garlic, no cucumbers. Mana, 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 nazo. Look at the promised land, sir. Evil has giants. All right, choose as a leader, we are going back into bondage. We are going back to Egypt. That's what Jesus said. He said, listen, broad is the road that leads to destruction. It's wide. It's easy. You don't get bruised. Nobody calls you names. Your family will not come and tell you they don't know what is going on with you. They will like the way you plotted your life. You have a good and regular job. <laughs> You have any good money, you are saving enough money to buy a car after six years. You've got, you, you are going to get a house. Your life is very predictable. Your whole family likes it. You married a girl from the village next door so your mother can speak her language. And you've, you've, of course, you've had your two children and you contracepted the rest away because God can't take care of more than three, two. Yes, let's tell the truth. Children are a problem from the Lord. <laughs> is that not how Christians reason? Yes. The fruit of the womb is a trouble. Blessed is the person that has very few of them. So he can send them to very good schools and go on holiday abroad. 
Think about it. Is that not how we reason? We take the scripture, turn it on his head. It is clear. Children are the heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is a reward. And it's a blessing to have a quiver full. You know, people that say, it depends on the size of your quiver. Don't be stupid. <laughs> that scripture, you could read it in context. The context was about abundance, not about the size of your personal quiver that you invented in modern days. Let's face it, let's be, let's be real for goodness sake. He said, Pastor, do you mean you like to have children? I don't know. All I know is that blessed is a man that has a quiver full. And if you read the context of it, he said the man will be able to stand and talk when the enemies are talking because he has an army. How do we like to reason away the word of God? Say, my quiver is small. That's a poverty mentality. It's a below mentality. It's not above mentality. Let's get this in clear. If you know what we do with the word of God sometimes, we go shape up. Like I tell people, say, eh, eh, come, how can you open your mouth? The same people, are, you know, imams are very, very nonsensical in their way of thinking. They want two children, then they go on one holiday. That holiday could have paid six years education in a top university. Vanity. People pursue vanity every day and be reasoning away with the word of God. Listen, I, I, that's one that annoys me. If you want to have one and have children, it's your problem. But don't touch that scripture. What did I say? You didn't hear me. You didn't say it well. Don't touch that scripture. After all, John the Baptist had no children. After all, um, uh, Jesus Christ did not have children. After all, Paul did not marry. But they did not touch that scripture. So let's leave the scripture. Leave it. Talking about entering the kingdom. <laughs> no, honestly, this is how we read the Bible. Children are a problem for the Lord. The fruit of the womb is harassment. Any man has sinned, God gives him six. Because the blessed one has only one. That is how we reason. Please tell your neighbor, don't touch the scripture. <laughs> tell somebody else, don't touch that scripture. <laughs> I'm talking about the kingdom. The door to the kingdom is tight. It's not popular. Your friends will call you woman rapper if you are nice to your wife. Yes, if you are submissive to your husband, they are going to call you names. After all, you have a PhD. Pull him down. <laughs> it took your wife for someone to get the meaning of PhD there. <laughs> Pull the man down. We are all equal. What does it mean? You don't watch too much television. Gender equality. From the bottom of hell. All those things that they say. Everybody has his role in life. When genders are single, they are equal. When gender don't marry. <laughs> Somebody is the boss. Why did I say it like that? Because people just need to wake up for goodness sake. And stop touching the scripture. Stop twisting the word of God because you don't like it. That's why a man wrote a, a Bible for homosexuals. Yes, they wrote it. Twisted every scripture that had to do with sexual perversion and rewrote it. To him, it's promiscuity that's the problem. Homosexuality is not a problem. We can be abusing the man and insulting him and promising him hellfire. We do our it in our own way. Take the scripture and shave it off. They say, rule your house by democracy. I say, which Bible? Everybody should try and come to an agreement. I said, what? The other day, I, 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 I wrote a sailor moment on it. I said, this issue of finding the common ground is satanic. What the Bible says to the man is, love your wife as Christ loved the church. Make sure that her best interest is in the front of your heart all the time. Always do things that will improve her life. He didn't say do everything that she likes. There's a word of difference. Make the best decision, informed, anointed, for the interest of the home. That's what they call love your wife, as Christ loved the church. Not to the woman and say what? Be subject to your own husband. Did not say let's find a common ground. Democracy is not the will of God in the family. If you are not ready to marry a husband, leave him alone. If you are not ready to marry a wife, leave the poor girl alone. She's looking for leadership. That's why she's marrying you. Don't touch that scripture. Don't touch it. I'm talking about kingdom. To enter into it, eh? 
That is what the issue is. We like the kingdom. To enter his world, we say, no, we don't agree. Let me give you... No, if I start, I won't leave there. I know if you like marriage seminar. People love marriage seminar. Because if I continue, I will get stuck there. So I need to pull out. Let me consciously... Monkey, come back. Come back. I see them, they are pulling me inside. No, no, I don't agree. <laughs> I'm going to preach my message. The one I have for today. <laughs> now, what I'm just trying to emphasize is that to enter the kingdom, it requires what? Also, take hardship. Take some difficult things. It can bruise. But that is how we enter the kingdom. The kingdom is beautiful. Entering it, Jesus said, is straight. The road is very small. What it means is that the number of people traveling there, you see, there are very few. They don't need a wide road. They are too few. Because the gate is tight. Anytime we want to, we're having issues in life. That's what I'm, remember, that's what I'm talking about. How do we solve problems? The way some people used to solve it is that they take the way of the world. That's where I'm going. When we want to enter the kingdom, we don't do that. When we have challenges, we go for the way of God. He said, open to me the gates of righteousness. He said, that is the one that the righteous enters through. David was speaking. I think it's Psalm 118. Open to me the gates of God. There are different ways to get results. There are different ways. But one of the ways you get results is called the gates of God. And what the results you get will do for you depends on the gate you enter through. Did you hear what I said? I need to say that. It's not, the re- it's not just the result. It's how you got it. Let's use money as an example. Money is a physical substance. You can all see it. Money, people say, is the root of all evil. It's not. Money is just money. Money is not good. It's not bad. It's neutral. Money is totally neutral. If you take money and go to the market and buy food, that's good. If you take that same money, go to the market, buy plenty of booze, drink until you have an accident, drunk, that's bad. Someone has said money killed him. Money didn't kill him. It's what he did with money that killed him. Results are like that. But God said there is a spirit behind every result. Jesus said, enter by the narrow gate. Because blood is the one that leads to destruction. Many go through it. Now, what was he saying? It is how you enter your results that determines what you get out of it. It's not the result itself. Some people want to enter by will of darkness and get the result of light. You see, a lot of people are very funny human beings. They say they just want to do small crime. Then when they've made money, they will start a business. <laughs> start laughing. When they start, just start laughing. That business has, its, its, it has demons holding the foundation. The man can never stop. He can't stop stealing. If you start a business with stolen money, you can never stop stealing. Why? The spirits control you. The spirits control. They control some people, they go, go and look, look, look for money all kinds of ways. The boy will go to campus and join a cult. They don't know why. Some of these pastors that will be going around using money to raise offering and collecting and building houses, I feel sorry for them. That money. If you know what it is doing for you, 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 will, you will rather walk naked, wearing ordinary pattern, and eating from, this, from the dump yard, than eat that money and live in the house. Because when you get a result through those funny, funny, funny methods... It delivers a spirit into your soul. You know, you, you won't know why your girls are just loose. You taught, you taught them scripture. God said, it is the money. This boy is so wicked. He's so wicked. What is wrong with him? God says, it is the money. The money is corrupt. It's evil. It's bad. It brought a spirit with it into the house. That's why we Christians, we are... Con- Listen, we are... Careful how we get results. For us, results don't justify anything. No. If you're a preacher, if you like, have a church of 10,000 people. If you lied and build that, that church on lies, let's leave it like that. You're on your own. Results don't justify anything for us Christians. Precepts, precepts, divine precepts, how you got the result. That's what we're talking about. When people have challenges in life, one of the ways they do it, they go into the way of the world to solve their problems. 
Like I'm talking about kings. In Israel, they say we want a king. They have a trouble. God said, listen, that is, you want to mix light with darkness. It is not supposed to be like that. What, like I mentioned last time, please go and listen to my message. What's wrong with the king? The issue was that their troubles were tied to disobedience. All the troubles of Israel, every trouble they had was a result of disobedience. There are two kinds of disobedience for Christians. Let me just quickly say it. A Christian can be disobedient because he's frankly, she's frankly disobedient to what is clear. Or a Christian can be disobedient because she, he or she refused to move away from one level of knowledge to another. Therefore, what is true today, or what was true yesterday, is no longer true today for that human being because there is a new level of revelation supposed to be working in. Let me give you an example. In the body of Christ generally, there was a time all people preached was evangelism, evangelism, and it was good. Then God brought the message of holiness. I'm talking about Nigeria now. Holiness came in. That's where you see church life, deeper life, and all that. That's where they came out from. The time came, the Pentecostal wave came in. The feeling of the Spirit, you understand? Operations of the gifts of the Spirit came in. Listen, everybody that did not move into the new thing God was doing, they disappeared. They were not wrong, but you see, nobody has the complete truth of God in himself. So God brings new levels of truth once in a while. So they start having challenges. Let me give you an example. The gospel of prosperity. The problem with the gospel of prosperity, all right, is that it's the most attractive to the world. <laughs> it doesn't mean the gospel is wrong. When you are preaching holiness, no, 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 no worldly person will come to your church. Won't come. So it was good. <laughs> it kept the church safe. But you're supposed to grow to a particular level. You understand? And be able to understand a particular dimension of truth. Like, I've been talking about prosperity, being service, not having. Do you get my point? The mentality in which you're, in quote, rich, but your life is not much different from the guy that's next door because for you, money is work. It's not chop. I don't know where I get the point. Yes, it's just work. That is, this guy is a preacher, so he uses talk to bless people. I am a moneyer. I use money. I don't know whether you get my point. As preacher, there's money here. I use money to bless people. So two of us are equals, even though he doesn't have a company worth a billion dollars, all right? But he has scripture worth a billion dollars. I don't know whether you get my point. So he gets up and opens his mouth and blesses people with scripture. And they leave the place hungry. Do you understand what I'm saying? No, Jesus used to do it. Yeah. <laughs> Did you notice? Jesus would preach for this. <laughs> the disciples would say, wait till. They have not eaten. You are getting my point. So the other man, his own ministry now starts. You have been preaching, they've been blessed, but the flesh is now weak because of your preaching. Thank you. Then he now comes with his own you know, blessing and then releases into them, which is material blessing. At the end of the day, everybody is lifted up because of different ministries. You, you understand the logic here? Now, this is what happened. Because, like, that, that prosperity thing now, that was attracted to the world, so that one just spoiled. You know when I say something is spoiled? That one was spoiled fast. Spoiled fast. You see small, small boys that know nothing driving big, big cars as a sign of prosperity in ministry. So they gave the gospel a bad name. You know, I, see, I, I knew many apostles of prosperity. All they did was raise money. They were not apostolic anything. If you're a true apostle of prosperity, those you preach to will prosper. I don't know what I get by it. Not, you're not there collecting their money. It's not the church you come to preach that becomes rich because you took offering. Oh God, I hope I'm not polluting your mind. Now, I'm going, some, I'm, I'm going somewhere now. Now, but some people, beca- now let me say that to you. Because some people abuse the truth, does not justify you rejecting it totally. Because if there's a blessing in it, you also will not get that blessing. So that's why you have to be careful. You have to be discerning. Now, I'm bringing an issue here. So when some people rejected that truth, with all their holiness and righteousness work, they, nev- they were always poor. They wouldn't have put to it. Why? There's a truth that they were supposed to walk in. Refusal to walk in it became for them disobedience. Because look, if I, I can bless you, it's not the problem, but you all have to just hear truth. I said to my wife the other day, I said, listen, I, I took a book by Kenyon, Two Kinds of Faith. I said, I need to read this book again. So there will be some fundamentals of Christianity that are supposed to take you to a new level. You won't miss it. There are people that God sent into your life to release a gift to you. You've refused to listen to them. You don't know why you are having challenges in an area. 
You think you know everything. You go to a church where your pastor says he's the, he's the king. You know, I see, I, you know, I see preachers sometimes that the way they talk. How you, there's a way I know a preacher I will never listen to. If I never hear you quote anybody, you are dangerous. Because you are giving me an impression. Now, only you know book. No, it's to no book. Yeah, I won't like you. I may tolerate you, lest it be that um, there's something you know that we need to learn. But I won't like you. I know churches, I'm sorry. There's a church I have in mind. I will give you your own name, in case you're a member of the church, so that you can save your life. You are still young. You won't die now. But if you stay long enough, you soon die. You understand? So let me just warn you now. They tell their members, this church is so pure and holy. These students, campus fellowship. When you go home on holiday, they don't go to another church. There are fellowships like that. Because our God knows everything. They are forbidden from attending other churches, even though they are true gospel churches. They say, don't go there, so that they don't teach you something different. Why? This man is the only one that God sent to you. Recipe for short life. Recipe for problem. Please. I'm saying many things. Let me sit on my message. Listen, when we have challenges in life as Christians, it is because there is a level of truth we are supposed to walk in, we are not walking in. Sometimes it's because we are deliberately disobedient to the word of God. But most times, for good people who would not deliberately disobey God, there's a level of truth God says, step into, they refuse. It now becomes for them, Sin, been at this same level till now. Let me say one to you. <laughs> if you are still praying, you know, there was a time you prayed and said, God, I have done this. Do for me. And he had mercy on you. And he blessed you back. And you got stuck in that thing that when you want to do something, you do for God. God is watching. And I say, so he tells the angels, lead this boy, lead this girl to go and listen to Banky. Let him tell him the truth. So you come to me and I say to you, Christ is a final sacrifice. Your money is not a sacrifice. Your rushing to church on time is not a sacrifice. Christ is a final sacrifice. Once I teach you that truth, if you go back home and sow a seed, you are in trouble. You know why? It has become for you disobedience. Not because you must obey me. It's not me. It is that there's a level of truth you did not know. God has sent me to teach it to you. You can never give to God anything that can compare with what Jesus did for you on the cross. You did not know before. But then you now know. Some people don't want to play safe. If you want to break through, who will give a millionaire to break through by tomorrow? You get up, God say, just watch me. By tomorrow, if you don't lose 10 million, I'm not God. But you gave this million last year and you got a hundred. I, I hope I get my point. God say, don't worry. It was ignorance. I tolerated it. I saw the cry of your heart for something. And I answered you. But just like I did to Cornelius... And now sent an angel to go and bring Peter to your house. Peter has come to your house now. You still want to attain righteousness by almsgiving. It has now become disobedience. There is a level of blessing that can never come into your life as long as you are struggling by your own effort. And when God wants to remove you from one level and go to another, he allows those challenges to wake you up. You will sow a seed tomorrow, you get broke. You sow more, you get broke as still. He said, what is going on? He said, before now, as used to say, my servant is the most generous of those my children. He said, but let us move him. His name is Job to another level. So, <laughs> are you getting my point? So when they say, Job, what did you do wrong? He said, no, I've been a great giver. I never did anything wrong. Why am I having these troubles? Elihu now says, listen, Job, it's not like that. Then God takes over from Elihu and begins to speak. And he says, you have done well. Job said, I tried. So let me show you something. He began to show Job what Job did not even understand as a walk in righteousness. Job now said, Ah, now I, a man who said he had never sinned, now said, Now I repent in dust and in ashes. How can you repent when you have never sinned? That is what God, God just, you know what God was saying to Job? All your righteousness was like filthy rags. Let me show you a new level of righteousness. After that, Job learned righteousness by faith. Righteousness by faith existed before the New Testament. It's in the book of Habakkuk like that. The just shall acquire life by faith. David understood righteousness by faith. He said, if you will number iniquity, who will stand? 
This man understood it. For Job to enter that level, God allowed the trouble that went to him. Go and read the Bible. It was never Satan's idea what happened to Job. It was God's idea. Job, you know, God was doing many things. One of them was to bring Job up to a, never, in, to a new level of righteousness he had never exi- understood before. Listen, if God wants to release something on you, he needs to take you to a new level of understanding. And once he takes you there, you hold on to it. You don't go down. Because the down one becomes for you iniquity after that. What I've told you is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And so help us God. The Lord is good. Back to what I was saying. So when we have challenges, what do we do? We go for a deeper level of truth. We try to learn some more. We want to know what we did not know before. Because that is what our challenges are about. Israel thought their challenges were because they didn't have a king. Somebody who said, your business is having trouble. That time I said you should get a politician on board. He did not. That is darkness being mixed with what? Light. Once you have troubles, you are in the house, you are a parent, suddenly your children start misbehaving, all of them. Don't bring out a cane. First. Ask your wife what is going on. You can discover that it is a wickedness you have shown your wife in the last one month that's manifesting those children. I'm serious, though. Or you woman, you started going for a women's fellowship. You know some women's fellowship are dangerous places. I don't mean every woman's fellowship. Oh, please, women, don't mind me. Oh. One day my wife went for a women's fellowship. She called me from there. Say, husband, what is going on here? The guest minister was just lying, deceiving people, and invoking the power of evil spirits into their lives. Witchcraft. I'm not kidding. By the time the woman finished teaching, my wife was like, is this girl okay? She came to tell me at home. Teaching people how to be wise. And all the wisdom was pure deception. So there was a time my husband and I used to keep money together. Ah, and the way we were using money, I didn't like it. Ah, you have to be wise, though. You have to be wise. You have to be wise, though. You have to be wise. <laughs> what was the wisdom? I went and told him that in our office, they said we needed to open a new salary account. That's how I just removed my salary from the account we used to hold together. My sister's wisdom. This woman was preaching. And when we were sitting down there, I, I have many things to say. Listen, you set structure in your heart for the release of God's power. Listen, it is a kind of structure that is set in your heart by the words that you hear that decides what is entering into you. I know what I am saying. Don't listen to every nonsense people say. Oh. That's why the Bible was given to you. Test every spirit. Test the spirit before you open your heart to it. That one is that woman was releasing a witchcraft spirit to a bundle of women. Sorry for all the husbands that day. No, listen, no woman who went there with, without a shield of faith will have a home that's quiet for the next one month. Until the husband and said, What is going on here? There are times you have to lay hands and deliver your wife from witchcraft spirit. Listen. <laughs> Sometimes that's what happened. Your wife probably went for one of those funny fellowships about the light. She now became rebellious at heart. And when a woman is rebellious, the children pick up the spirit. They don't know how they do it. They pick it up. They start grumbling against their parents behind their backs. And you won't know. It's because the woman has been going for a particular fellowship. There are good women's fellowship. Get my point. I'm not saying there are just about one I'm telling you about. And there are many of them. A witchcraft coven that come to church. <laughs> I'm not lying. There are many people they say that they are doing women ministry. They are witches. Just like all this, uh, some of these babalao, you know, all these uh, DBS that have one suit and one tie. Tie, tie, uh, pack in the city, tie in the village. I'm not a Christmas goat. You've seen all those? All those. <laughs> in the same manner, eh? Some witches are running women's, women's deliverance meeting. Any woman that goes there becomes a stubborn head, hard-hearted, mean. Children will not eat. She will go for a prayer meeting. Expecting God to answer that prayer. That prayer God don't, does not answer. Say, God, this is my year of breakthrough. Go home and go and cook for those children. Come on, breakthrough. If I break you down, you know something. <laughs> I, I'm not lying to you. You leave a house at 5 a.m. in the morning. Children are going to school by 7. Where do they go to job? Just sit there and gather early in the morning. 
come home with evil spirits or rebellion. You don't know why the, children, the boys are joining cults in school. I'm saying many things, but you know the year is coming to an end. So many things to learn. This is which we have not finished. I, I will finish preaching. <laughs> I must finish preaching my preaching. You must learn these things by force. Your life will be good in Jesus' name. Yeah. Yeah, so let anybody deceive you because of spirituality. I want you to know that sometimes you say, listen, listen, listen. Don't bring out a cane. Go home and go and pray. Say, what is going on? God will reveal to you. Say, oh boy, ever since you started running after that business, you have become a wicked man, and that is what your children are manifesting. He said, oh girl, ever since you started going to that, your funny fellowship, you've been learning bad things. All this, no, Holy Spirit does that for you. I was saying something earlier. It is what you arrange your heart for. That is the kind of spirit that flows into you. Why we pay attention to the word of God so that the right spirit can flow into us. This story is just in my mind. Let me tell it to help if, 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 if one or two people. A man of God was telling a story. He said a man came to him with his wife who had left him because the woman had gotten tired and left. He said, I need help. What is the help? He said, I started molesting young girls. That's why his wife left. He said, but his wife agreed to come with him to come and see this preacher because she realized that she needed help and he wanted to get help. So the man said, well, listen to her, to him. And he said that, the man said, I think I have an evil spirit. The man of God said, no, you don't have an evil spirit. You have three. It's not one. That there are three. Why did he say so? He said, as the man was talking, suddenly he just discerned that there are three spirits inside this human being. And he said to him, I can cast them out, but I won't do it. He said, if I do it, you will become worse than you are right now. Unless I teach you some things to do. Now listen to this. It's a story he told about it that is the reason I'm talking about it. How did the man get his evil spirit? That's what I want to talk about. Uh, in case you are curious about what happened to him, he delivered the man eventually. But he said, first of all, what you will do is, you make me a promise. One, you go and burn those books. I'll talk about the books in a moment. And two, you will pray 30 minutes every day. And you will read your Bible every day. So why those instructions? So that the spirits don't come back. Usually when they come back, they are going to become more numerous and they, come, they are going to become more wicked. So that's why he refused to deliver the man initially until he had gotten the point across to this man. So even the man said it himself. That I came for help because I know how it happens. One of these days, I'm going to kill one of those small girls. And then, I'm going to get sentenced to death. I'm going to get caught. So he said he knows the progress. How come he knows the progress? I'll tell you. He was a professor of psychology in the university. Until he retired. And when he was there, he used to teach on the, the sexual criminal. So he was teaching the, 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 the psychology of the sexual criminal. After he gave his life to Christ as a retired old man, even though he had been a nominal Christian for a long time. He said, he said he picked up those his books and he began to read. He was reading his psychology books on the sexual criminal. And those spirits that were inside the book, boom, jumped inside him. Normally one would go in first. The other would listen, this house they here, call his neighbors, his friends who are homeless. Three evil spirits were inside the man. This man was about 60. He had never done this in all his life. He began it at that time. Man of God said, first thing you do, burn the books. So the man agreed. Of course, he went home, burnt all the books, and did what the man told him. Of course, he said there and then, he prayed for him and ordered the spirits to leave the man, and they came out of him immediately. And then the man was free. He said he saw the man years later. By the day he saw him, they were at a meeting. He was holding hands with that, his wife, of course, who had come back, and then their marriage was fantastic, all right? Now, why I told the story, well, when I heard him say that, I suddenly connected some things. You have to prepare a place for spirits in your life. If you want the flow of the power of God that we call grace, is a heart that is prepared. That's why it is not everything, listen to me, that you get involved in. It's not every music you dance to. When somebody starts telling you that, uh, yeah, I got two babes, I go here, I go there, don't dance. Say, thank you very much, I don't want again. Because once you start doing, before you know what's happening, this, it's not a, not be ordinary eye. It's a spirit. Do you hear what I said? 
It's a spirit. That's why people don't understand. They think, no, no, they are just rapping, just normal rap. It's not normal. Nothing is normal about it. It's not every book you read. Most of these romance novels get away from them. They are not innocent. You pick a book, they start from the beginning, boy meets girl, next thing, boy is on top of girl, girl is on top of boy, they, are, that, they, start, they start describing sex scenes. Don't read. Are you getting my point? Do not read. Do not read. Don't let your young boys and young girls read. There are too many good books out there that don't contain that nonsense to read. Those things were deliberately put inside there to wreck the morality of young people. It's a spirit. It is not about, uh, no, they, they will know what to do. No. They get possessed with a spirit. It's not a joke. It's not every, th- no, I've said it before, it's not everybody you hang out with. It's not everybody you hang out with. If your friends hang out in a place where they drink, they tell dirty jokes, don't go there. People say, no, I don't drink. I say, yes, thank you for not drinking. But who are you hang- hanging out with? It's the sharing of communion that matters. It's not the drink. It's who are you communing with? Because that is where spirits enter into people. A nice and decent man suddenly becomes an adulterer. That's where he got it. Some people tell you that it's business connection. <laughs> Some people get connected to evil. Say they are doing business. That's nonsense. What does, it, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world? And so far as the loss of his own soul. That's not what we are talking about. Listen, all this talk we are doing is to connect our hearts. Are you getting my point? In such a manner that the Holy Spirit flows into it. That's what I'm saying. Please bear that in mind. I said I was just digressing on that briefly. The point I was making is that, so when we have troubles, what God is saying is that, come, move to another level of grace by having understanding. Israel said, no, we will get a king. Because a king is not your problem. A king is not your problem. The problem is disobedience to the word of God. The problem is lack of understanding of the precepts of God. A king is not what you need. Believers, let's learn to interpret that. Every time we have challenges, be careful the kind of solution people bring to you. Once that thing takes away from your faith, it takes away from the straight line you've been walking in life. Rather let your business die than follow them. Because he that loves his life is the one that will lose it. But the one that's ready to lose his life for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of the knowledge of God, that's the one that finds it. Bear that in mind. A number of people in Israel, I don't have time now to go into it. I wanted to mention it, but let me just mention them briefly. They use this method. When they had problems in life, they went for temporal solutions and that became their undoing. You know Jeroboam? God made him king. He wanted to retain himself on the throne. What did he do? He built idols in Dan and in Beersheba. And he said, these are your gods, Israel. And the Bible said those things became the undoing of Jeroboam. One man that's very instructive to read. Let's quickly open to his own case. First Chronicles chapter 16. The story of Asa. Sorry, 2 Chronicles 16. It's not first. Because of time, I won't read it. I'll just <clears throat> highlight something. We can read it later, right? Asa was a man that was, very, that was blessed by God. He started, he started his life out well. You will see if you read chapter 15, you see how this man obeyed the words of prophecy. Remember, we succeed by listening to what? Prophesying of the word of God. There was a man, Azariah, the prophet... He gave Asa courage by his prophesying. And because of that, Asa went after God with all his heart. And then as a result, you will see in verse 19 of chapter 15, there was no more war in the life of Asa, but until a particular point in time, the 35th year of his reign. Then in the 36th year, now listen to this. In the 36th year, Asa had problems. When Asa wanted to solve his problem, a war came to him. Basha, the king of the northern kingdom, came against Asa, who was the king of Judah. And then Asa, in verse 2, brought out silver and gold from the treasuries 
of the house of the Lord and the king's house and sent to the king of Aram, Ben-Hadad. And then he made an agreement with him. And because of that, his problem went away. Now notice that because of that, his problem went away. Then a prophet came in verse 7. Now let me now read that. At that time, Hanani the seer came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, Because you have relied on the king of Aram, and have not relied on the Lord your God, therefore the army of the king of Aram has escaped out of your hand. That is, this man that came as a trouble to you, God brought him to you only so you could destroy him and remove his trouble permanently. But instead of you to rely on God, you relied on the arm of flesh. For that reason, your enemy escaped. Hanani went on to say, verse 8, Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubim an immense army with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to, move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support. I like King James here. He said that he might show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are, com- are perfect towards him or they are completely his. He said, you have acted foolishly. Indeed, though you got results now, from now on, you will surely have wars. Be careful what gives you results. Though. I hope you are getting my point. Be careful what gives you results. Make sure that whatever you do in life, you rely totally on the Lord. In Asa's case, he did not listen. Salvation comes through listening to the word of prophecy. When the word of God is prophesied to you, that's how salvation comes to you. But this man, instead of listening, he imprisoned the prophet. What was the consequence of it? He became severely diseased in his, uh, in his feet. Even then, he did not listen. The Bible says, instead of turning to God, he turned to the physicians. He turned to human methods. And for that reason, he died. Now, why did I tell the story of Asa? You will see that this man was blessed by obeying God. But when problems came to him, he responded the human way to solving his problems. And that's one thing I wanted to explain to us from last time. That let's be careful. The challenges in our lives, let's be careful how we interpret them. We must be very careful how we interpret challenges. There was a time, we're going to read the story of Israel. When they lost a battle against Ai, they did not, Joshua did not say, we need better commanders. He prayed and said, God, what have we done that is wrong? Listen, Christians, you will succeed in this life in the name of Jesus. Amen. What God wants to do for you is greater than what you have ever seen with your eyes. He's just saying, and that's why I'm preaching. He's just saying, I will accomplish it not the normal human method. Make up your mind that you will walk with me. Walking with me can be dangerous. Are you getting my point? Humanly speaking. It will appear as if you are going to lose everything. Make up your mind from the beginning that I have lost everything. I don't know whether you are getting my point. Wake up in the morning saying, this life, I'm a fool. I'm a fool for Christ Jesus. I'm a fool. I don't follow the way of the world. Abuse yourself very well. Let, you know, don't be, when you are young, please pray to young people. That's the time to be, very, very, to be a very foolish person. When everybody is sagging, wear long trousers, tie it properly. Are you getting my point? So that people, they're going to abuse you. You are used to being different. You are used to being different. That way, you will succeed in life. Because you won't care what people think. Once you are persuaded, once you are sure of what you are doing according to scripture, you won't care what they are thinking. That way, you will succeed in life. That's what I'm preaching. Let me close. We'll continue from this point. Next time, I'll summarize everything. Whatever it is that we have left, I'll try and you know, put it together. Listen. I did not say life is easy for Christians. I didn't say that. I just said that victory is sure. That's what I've just said. I didn't say it's easy. What did I say? Victory is sure. It is sure. But God says that victory, I want to bring it into your life by my strength. I'm not trying to help you through how to use worldly methods. No. I am trying to do something different and new. You will succeed simply by what the world will call foolishness. Like in the morning, everybody say, be at work by 8. Say, no, I don't come till 9. As an example, it's very funny. Why? Because 8 to 9, I de- do you get my point? I declare the word. You know, the other day we talked about uh, uh, the true cult. Can you remember our cult issue? We are the real cults of God, though. 
The problem is that we don't eat our sacrifices regularly and we don't do enough incantation. That is the problem. This, no, let me give you some funny tips by which Christians succeed. You open your business in the morning and literally let your staff be looking. That's their problem. Or better still, come earlier. Or come, the ones that believe, let them follow you. Come earlier. And just get to the door and speak a word to the door. In the name of Jesus, goodness will pass through here today. Evil will not pass through you. Door, do you understand me? I command you in Jesus' name. The door here has ears. You go to your, is it, what do you call that machine that collects money? ATM. Not ATM, no, no, no. Cash register. You will speak to it that your money will be complete, you will work well, it will incapacitate the thief. Do you know that? You read an advert in the newspapers, it looks like a kind of job you can do, you talk to the advert. Let me give you advice ahead of time. Make sure everybody thinks of God decrease. Those who don't understand pigeon, that means a guy is mental. The boss is not normal. <laughs> Aim for that reputation. Let people walk with you, think something's wrong with your head. If you can get that reputation, you will succeed in life. <laughs> what I mean, let them think you are crazy. Let your response be words. You, they say something, you, that is, they say the car is not firing anywhere. You sit behind the steering. In the name of Jesus, you start talking to the car. No one they get used to the fact that this man is not normal. Oh, just know you're on your way to victory. You're on your way to victory. They say the roads are bad. Trucks are always falling. Then when your truck's about to take off, you wait. You go to the tire. I stabilize you. I stabilize you in the name of Jesus. Go. Once you get that reputation, say, or oh, get the mental. That way you will succeed. You wake up in the morning and say, Ah, how many customers do I have yesterday? Twenty. Ah, how many can we service? They say 50. It's okay, good. Today, 50 customers, I call you from Abakliki to Onecha, to Abba, to Makodi. Come. Once they see you misbehaving like that, just know victory is your portion. When somebody takes your money, so you say, eh, I can call police. Oh. Just relax. I say, God will restore to me the years that the locusts ate, the canker worm, the palmer worm. You declare like that. So in the name of Jesus, we'll make more profit to overcome what we have lost. Get that kind of reputation. Believe me, you have succeeded. Once people are sure that you are mad, then you have succeeded. Do you <laughs> let the only people that don't think you are mad and those who are mad like you. Let only the fellow madmen think you are normal. Once those who are not in your cause think you are abnormal, then you will succeed in life. And when I say they think you're abnormal, you don't pursue money the way everybody else does. You return, you know, some people think, ah, you make it, you refuse for quick profit. Maybe you misquoted, you taught somebody, all right, you quoted for a job for him for 80,000 naira, only for you to discover that you made a mistake somewhere, and you actually added this 20,000 naira extra, and the man pays you find out a week later, he has paid, he's not complaining. You call him back. Say, sir, we are sorry, we made a mistake on your bill last week. Can we refund your 20000 And your staff say, oh, God, wait now. He does not know, he's not complaining. And you do that, they say, what is wrong with this man? Just, just know you're on your way to what? Victory. Because what you are doing by all of these things is that you're activating angels and grace to come and work in your business. Let me stop here. I hope you're blessed today. Yes, we'll finish it on Saturday. I'm, I have so many things. In all honesty, I don't think we went halfway. I, w- I want to talk more about that connecting with grace so that it can flow through our lives. That message, that's the short story I told about the man that was demon-possessed. It's a very powerful story because it lets us know things flow into our lives depending on what we imbibe as words. That's what I'm going to say. I hope you got my point. Let's quickly bow down our heads and just give the Lord thanks. And we're closing immediately. Let's rise to our feet so that from there we go. Let's say, Lord, thank you. Declare, de- declare to him, Lord, he is you. You are the source of my success, the source of victory. I give you the thanks. I give you the praise in the name of Jesus. I give you thanks. I give you the praise. Say, Lord, I commit myself to truth. Give me understanding when I have challenges. 
I look out for that which I need to obey, the new revelation of life, so that your word can flow into me, so that truth can flow, so that grace can flow to make me a victor, to give me the victory. Let's just take a few seconds, you know, just pray quickly. For the area you're having challenges, say, Lord, open my eyes that I may see the roots of this. It's important. You're having a suddenly challenge in your home, in your family, in your career, in your business, whatever it is, your ministry. Quickly pray, say, Lord, this challenge, what is the root? What is the acorn that is inside there? What spirit has come in? How did it get in? How do I block the door? How do we cast it out? It's very important. We don't box, Paul said, as one boxing the air. Say, Lord, give me understanding. Say, the righteousness of thy testimonies is everlasting. Give me understanding and I shall live. Say, Lord, I receive understanding. Give me understanding. Give me understanding. In the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we give you thanks. Lord, we give you thanks. Thank you for the victory that we have in Christ Jesus. Let's all declare, say, in the name of Jesus. In my life, all things are passed away. Darkness is separated away. I walk in light. I walk in the light of God. I walk in the light of the word of God. I, I triumph by grace. I win by grace. Grace is flowing towards me. Grace is flowing towards me. Every mountain before me becomes a plain. Say it again. Every mountain before me it becomes a plain. I speak to my mountains. Go down in the name of Jesus Christ. I speak to that mountain. Be moved. Listen, right now, I focus that word on a problem you are having. Please, do that. Do that. There is an anointing. There is a grace to solve that problem. Like I said, grace will tell you what to do. It will show you what to do. It will even tell you the prayer to pray. It will tell you the steps to take. You can say, get home, hug somebody. He can say, get home, give somebody. Get home, remove, burn this book. You stop reading it. Cut away from this friend. Delete that number. Don't call that man again. Now speak to that mountain. Speak to that mountain. Say, speak to that mountain in your life. Say, in the name of Jesus, be gone. And that mountain is cast into the sea right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we give you thanks for today. In Jesus' name we have prayed.